Hello and welcome to another episode of the 383 User Lab where we take a look at popular digital experiences to understand how they work, how they help real people get stuff done, but ultimately how they might be improved. In today's episode, we're going to take a look at the influence of psychology on design, understand why it's important, how it works, and take a look at a few interesting examples. So, wake up that grey matter and let's dive right in. It's fair to say that over time, design has progressively shifted from the notion of aesthetics for a purpose to a deeper appreciation of how to understand and affect real people through our design decisions. As designers were continually looking for new ways to grow our skills and knowledge to do this, as it's sadly not as simple as picking a meaningful typeface and using the latest trend in colour grads anymore. Now, I'm not a doctor, but I do know that spending time getting to know the people that you're designing for is really important. So to understand a bit more about this new skill set, I spoke to an actual expert, the author of Laws of UX, John Yablonski. I actually think that one of the most powerful and valuable non-design skills that a designer can possibly have is this, this kind of uh, understanding of human psychology in general, right? And I think that just as a designer, as a UX designer, um, understanding this blueprint a, a little bit more closely, a little bit more intimately just helps um, the design work uh, be that much more intuitive and human-centered. Building up that kind of design intuition, right? So that that innate sense of, of what can and cannot work based on just the underlying human psychology uh, of it all. And it's also, I think it's the responsibility of designers that, to, um, you know, we are the stewards of the user. We need to protect and advocate for them. Uh, not to be too self-serving, but I think lawsofus.com is a, <laughs> It's a really great reference because it's a it's a really soft introduction into that intersection of psychology and design, and it's kind of like a gateway into this universe, which is, you know, uh, you know, psychology is 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 been around for a long time, and and is um, there's a wealth of knowledge there. The challenge, oftentimes, in my opinion, is really um, translating the, the, these kind of concepts and principles from psychology into that kind of design process. While the field of psychology itself takes years of study, utilising it in design doesn't require a PhD or indeed a comfortable couch. It's optional, just not necessary. Now, there are obviously a lot of these techniques, concepts and principles to use. It can be a bit bewildering knowing how to get started. So I'm going to quickly run through two of my go-to UX laws to utilise when designing digital interfaces. First up is Hick's Law and Cognitive Load. In 1952, psychologists William Edmund Hick and Ray Hyman formulated the understanding that the time it takes to make a decision rapidly increases with the number and complexity of choices available. What this means is that complex designs and interfaces take considerably longer to understand and decode for the user, with a much higher cognitive load, which is the psychological principle of how much mental processing we have capacity for before things start to lag and become harder to discern, much like season two of Twin Peaks, for instance. Now, this is basically the excuse that you've been looking for to justify your excessive use of white space, just not your eight point type and your day glow gradients as well. That kind of stuff needs genuine help or a handlebar moustache. While it can sometimes be difficult to avoid complex things in our designs, what we can do to apply Hick's Law is break these complex tasks down into more digestible chunks, much like how Work & Co redesigned the Virgin America flight booking system a number of years ago. Now, they did this as a way of helping people who were trying to book flights from getting bogged down by thinking about too many things at once. So when you're booking your departure date, you're not getting distracted by when to return or where your seat is on the plane, and if you're really going to pass off that case as carry-on luggage. Next up we have Gestalt. Now while this sounds like it's a German horror movie, it's actually a set of principles based upon human visual perception and basic pattern recognition. This is where we form assumptions and react differently to elements based upon how they are positioned, how big they are and how we read a screen. This is where we invent relationships between similarly shaped or styled objects, inferring connections between items that are closer in proximity to one another, and mentally group elements that share a boundary. The benefit of using something like Gestalt is the ability to use design to create a clear hierarchy of information on the page and organise all of your myriad screen elements to create a clear rhythm and flow. 
A good example of how this is used in design is in experiences that use a lot of technical information, like overly large digital retail experiences or buying something that is relatively detailed like a car. Take the Autotrader site for instance. It contains a lot of information from the word go, but with the very nature of everything that you need to know about a vehicle at first glance. So there's a huge job here for the design to do in helping the user make sense of what they're looking for. And by creating a visual relationship between content and through the use of spacing, grids, colour, weight of text and clear calls to action, it's fairly easy to get to grips with how to navigate their vast catalogue of vehicles, along with which levers to pull and switches to flick to find that dream car that you've always wanted. It's fair to say there's considerably more to design psychology than we've actually covered today. And as the job of designers to help users navigate the things that we're making gets harder, so are the best tools that we can utilize, things that make that process simpler, ideally by understanding how real people think and understand and behave when faced with the things that we're designing. So to give a quick example of how psychology can help something relatively complex be understood much easier, I challenged one of our designers to look at the Amazon product experience. Amazon does a pretty good job of housing such a vast amount of products and services, allowing customers to sort and filter taxonomies with a degree of simplicity. Browsing an Amazon product page, however, can be somewhat overwhelming with many distractions due to an abundance of features, inconsistent styles and repetitive content make it extremely difficult to navigate. I tackle these challenges by breaking content down into digestible chunks and adding breathing space to the layout, which helps direct the user's attention. Defined product sections of overview, reviews and recommendations allows for progressive onboarding, minimising cognitive load and reducing the amount of choice and effort involved. It also cuts out all of the bloat and repetitive content, surfacing the important detail by removing features and functionality that isn't a top priority. So there you have it. Hopefully a quick primer on using psychology in design, how it's useful, how you can get started. And as ever, if anybody wants to reach out to find out more, then please feel free to get in touch. So that's it for today. Join us next time as we dive into dissecting and redesigning more digital experiences. Until then, take care and catch you later.